Welcome to Algorithms Made Easy, a step-by-step -step guide. Today we're diving into the fascinating world of algorithms, but what is an algorithm? Simply put, it's a set of instructions designed to perform a specific task. It's like a recipe. You have a list of ingredients, inputs, and step-by-step -step instructions to whip up a delicious meal. The output. Algorithms are everywhere, from the GPS system that navigates you home to the search engine that fetches your desired results in microseconds. They form the backbone of modern computing, helping us solve complex problems efficiently. In the realm of computer science, algorithms play a pivotal role. They allow computer programs to process information, make decisions, and perform tasks. They are the invisible cogs that keep the digital world spinning. Remember, the beauty of an algorithm lies not just in solving a problem, but in solving it optimally. Now that you understand what an algorithm is, let's move on to the next topic. Next, we delve into time and space complexity. Picture this. We're in a world where efficiency is king. Algorithms are the loyal subjects carrying out the king's orders. But how do we measure their efficiency? Enter time and space complexity. Time complexity considers how quickly an algorithm can solve a problem. It's like a sprinter. The faster they complete the race, the better. On the other hand, space complexity is all about how much memory an algorithm needs. It's akin to a minimalist traveler. The less luggage they carry, the better. Both these concepts are vital in evaluating the effectiveness of an algorithm. Just like in life, balance is key. An algorithm that runs at lightning speed but eats up memory like a gourmet buffet is as problematic as one that takes eons to complete but uses memory sparingly. With time and space complexity in mind, let's discuss different data structures. Data structures form the backbone of efficient algorithms. So what exactly are these data structures? Well, they're essentially the building blocks that hold data and enable us to perform operations on that data. Let's break down some of the most common ones. First, we have lists, which are like digital strings of pearls, each pearl representing a piece of data. Then we've got stacks. Think of these like a stack of books, where you can add or remove books only from the top of the stack. Queues, on the other hand, function like a line at a coffee shop, where the first one in is the first one out. Next, we have binary trees, heaps, and hash tables. Binary trees are like family trees, but for data. Heaps are similar, but with a twist. They're specialized trees that maintain a specific order. And finally, hash tables. They're like super efficient digital librarians, instantly knowing where every piece of data is stored. Keeping these data structures in mind, let's explore sorting and searching algorithms. Sorting and searching are fundamental algorithmic problems. Now let's dive into some popular sorting algorithms. First up, we have the bubble sort, a simple algorithm that repeatedly steps through the list, compares adjacent elements, and swaps them if they are in the wrong order. Next, we have the insertion sort, which builds a sorted list one item at a time, much like how you sort playing cards in your hand. Moving on, we come to quick sort. This algorithm takes a divide and conquer approach, partitioning an array into two halves, then sorting them independently. And finally, there's the merge sort, another divide and conquer champ. But this one works by dividing the unsorted list into n sublists, each containing one element and then repeatedly merging sublists to produce newly sorted sublists. But what about searching? Well, there are two primary types. Linear search, which checks every element until it finds a match, and binary search, which repeatedly divides the list in half until it locates the target. With sorting and searching covered, let's advance to recursion. Recursion can make complex problems simpler. Just like a fractal pattern, recursion is a method where the solution to a problem depends on solutions to smaller instances of the same problem. Think of it like a set of nesting dolls. To get to the smallest one, you have to open each doll one by one. Here's an example, the Fibonacci sequence. Each number in the sequence is the sum of the previous two numbers. We can write a recursive algorithm to calculate any number in the sequence by summing the two previous ones. Now let's talk about the stack. Each recursive call adds a layer to the stack. If the stack gets too high, we encounter a stack overflow, which is like toppling a too tall tower of blocks. In essence, recursion is a way of breaking down a problem into smaller, more manageable pieces. It's a powerful tool in the programmer's toolkit. Recursion is a powerful tool. Now let's explore graphs and graph algorithms. Graphs are a versatile data structure. They're like a playground for data where each piece of data or node is connected to others through edges. Imagine a city as a graph with each location as a node and roads as edges. 
Now, if you want to visit all locations, you'd need a method or traversal algorithm. Depth First Search, or DFS, is like exploring a path until you hit a dead end, then backtracking. Breadth First Search, or BFS, is like exploring all immediate neighbors before moving on. What about finding the shortest route? That's where Dijkstra and Bellman Ford come in. They're like your GPS, determining the shortest path between two nodes. And if we want to connect all nodes with the least total edge weight, we'd use a minimum spanning tree algorithm. Kruskal and Prim are two popular ones, creating a tree that includes every node without forming a cycle. Graphs offer many possibilities. Let's look at dynamic programming next. Dynamic programming optimizes by breaking problems down. A mouthful, isn't it? But fear not, we're breaking this down too. So dynamic programming or DP is a strategic method used in computer science for solving complex problems. It works by breaking the problem down into simpler, smaller sub-problems and solving each one only once, storing their solutions in case we need them again. Think of it like a jigsaw puzzle. You don't try to put together the whole puzzle at once, right? Instead, you split it into smaller sections, solve them, and then piece them together. That's dynamic programming in a nutshell. Now the magic of DP lies in its efficiency. By storing the solutions to sub-problems, we avoid the need to solve them again, saving valuable time and computational power. It's a classic case of working smarter, not harder. So whether you're tackling a tricky coding problem or trying to optimize an algorithm, dynamic programming can be a game changer. Now let's discuss greedy algorithms. Greedy algorithms make locally optimal choices. Now that may sound a bit complex, so let's break it down. Greedy algorithms are like those folks at a buffet who pile their plates sky-high on their first trip, hoping to get the most out of their meal. They make the best choice at each step, aiming for immediate advantage, hence the name greedy. Consider a simple real-life example. When making change, a greedy algorithm would always choose the largest coin or note that doesn't exceed the remaining amount. This strategy works pretty well for most currencies. But here's the catch greedy algorithms don't always lead to the best global solution. They can be short-sighted, missing out on better overall outcomes because they're too focused on the immediate prize. Think about our Buffett goers again. They might fill up on appetizers and miss out on the main course. Greedy algorithms can be efficient yet risky. Now let's explore NP problems. Not all problems are created equal. In the world of algorithms, some problems are notoriously difficult to solve. These are known as NP problems. The term NP stands for non-deterministic polynomial time. It's a mouthful, but what it means is that these are problems for which a solution can be checked quickly, but finding that solution can take an incredibly long time. Now within this class of NP problems, there are two types that are particularly interesting, NP complete and NP hard problems. NP complete problems are the most difficult problems in the NP class. If you can find an efficient way to solve one NP-complete problem, you can solve all of them. On the other hand, NP-hard problems are at least as hard as the hardest problems in NP. They're the real beasts of computational complexity. Understanding NP problems can be challenging but rewarding. Now let's look at algorithms in practice. Finally, let's talk about the future of algorithms. The world of algorithms is ever-changing, evolving at a pace that's both exciting and challenging. As we peer into the horizon, we see the dawn of new trends shaping this landscape, the giants among them being machine learning and artificial intelligence. These are not just buzzwords, they are powerful tools that leverage algorithms to learn from data, make predictions, and drive decision-making. Machine learning algorithms, for instance, are behind the scenes in everything from personalized recommendations on your favorite streaming service to autonomous vehicles navigating our roads. Meanwhile, artificial intelligence is harnessing these algorithms to mimic human intelligence, creating systems that can understand, learn, and react. These advancements are pushing the boundaries of what algorithms can do, and their potential is truly limitless. As we step into this promising future, we must strive to deepen our understanding, hone our skills, and stay curious. Thank you for joining us on this journey through algorithms. Remember, practice makes perfect. Keep coding.